Welcome to the B Word Podcast, the podcast for women who know they're meant for more and just need a little bit of help getting there. I'm Joanne Bolt, and I am obsessed with helping women just like you move out of the messy middle and into a business that is sassy, classy, and a little badassy. Together, we'll unpack it all from money and mindset to the little simple strategies that you can implement today in your business. Grab a glass of wine and your AirPods and curl up on the couch because happy hour with your besties has begun right now here on The B Word. Hey friends, welcome back to The B Word. Today we're gonna talk about four mistakes in marketing you may be making and that are causing you to be broke as a joke. Now, it is no joke when you are broke, so let's make sure we get some revenue back in your business. Why am I talking marketing? Well, as a college major in marketing at the University of Georgia, I understood one thing very, very well is that you need sales in order to run a business. And in order to get those sales, you either have to have a lot of conversations with people or you had to have excellent marketing. And when you can merge the two together is where a lot of that magic gets sprinkled in. So what are some of the mistakes that you may be making that are not creating the revenue in your business that you need? I'm gonna dive into them. I'm gonna break them down for you. And good news, They all have really simple fixes. It just means we need to be thoughtful and mindful about how we're putting our marketing efforts into place in our business and take the time to fix our leaks. Okay, you ready? Let's dive in. The first one is you need to dare to be different. Stop trying to look like everyone else. It is really easy when you're on social media to check out other people in your industry. And if you start to see trends and how they are producing their content, well, it's kind of just natural for you to incorporate that into your own. From colors and logos to the type of speech that they even use or the captions that they use. When you see it over and over and over again, it actually gets ingrained in your brain. And so you may not realize that you're blending in with the crowd and not standing out because to you, it's just natural to create it that way because you've seen too much of it. I'll give you a great example. The real estate industry is very bad about this. I believe it's because in every office, there's probably two to 300 agents. And so when a realtor goes into the office, they make a bunch of real estate agent friends. They start following them on social media. And the next thing they see is all of their successful realtor friends doing the same type of post, the post about home buying, the front image of the home because they put a home on the sale, or the buyers or sellers at the closing table or the title company when they've actually completed the sale of the home, holding up a key that says, we did it, we closed. I get it. Those are great posts. But if every agent in your area is making the same post, how are you standing out? If you really take the time to think this through, almost no super successful person who's a little bit ahead of their game, a little bit ahead of their industry does exactly what the other people do. They all put a twist on it that is a little bit different. So if we go back to the real estate example, let's look at my friend, Hannah Smith. Her handle on Instagram is Hannah the Property Geek and geek out she does. I absolutely adore watching her on social media and I've gotten to know her as a person and her personality absolutely in person matches what you see online. Hannah is from Minneapolis. She's an EXP two-time icon agent, which means she sells a shit ton of homes, guys. She really is at the top of her game and she has a team called the Property Geeks. Now, what makes Hannah different is that you'll hardly ever see on her social media that couple at the closing table with the key, the front of the house photo that says just listed, or any like tips and tricks on the home buying. You don't see them. What you see is really funny reels and really funny memes where Hannah lets her personality shine. She makes hilarious faces. She makes hilarious hand gestures. She makes fun of herself. What she does is educate people on the home buying and selling process through humor. She kind of makes fun of the industry a little bit and yet does it in a way to where you want to watch her reels because they're so funny. You find yourself learning a little bit about her, her team, and the market that they serve. 
Now she has 26,000 followers on Instagram and that's fantastic. Guarantee you she's not selling that many homes a year in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but because she dares to be different and because she does things a little bit, not like every other real estate agent in the United States, people follow her, which gives her opportunity. And your marketing is all about creating opportunity for your business. It gives her opportunity to really get her name out in Minneapolis. It also gets her opportunity for other agents across the U.S. to find her, to send her referrals. And recently, Hannah's begun speaking at real estate conferences and on stages because now her social media presence has given her the opportunity to teach other agents, which also grows her revenue. And she did it by being who she is, which is a little bit nerdy and a little bit geeky. And she wasn't afraid to put that on social media to not follow the norms of what everyone else does. So rule number one, dare to be different. Hannah, you have nailed it. Good job. Rule number two, going after the shiny object syndrome. I am all for trying new tactics in my marketing to see what works and doesn't work. The problem occurs when you grab at everything and you don't actually evaluate anything. So a lot of people will go into marketing and they'll start new email blast, or they'll start a podcast, or they'll start sending out mailers, or they'll start creating ads on Instagram or Facebook, or going live on TikTok or Instagram or Pinterest or, or whatever the shiny object is at the moment that you think is going to be the end all for your business. And then you don't evaluate it. So six months later, seven months later, you look at that shiny object and you say, oh my gosh, I don't need to do this because it's not creating the revenue in my business. That's a marketing mistake. The marketing mistake is just assuming that because you can't see the surface level result that you need to quit something. If you put a lot of effort into it, I would encourage you to put that same effort into really digging into, is it actually beneficial or is it a fail in the business? And I can give you a very recent example of this. Last week in the podcast, Her Community, we were having a weekly coffee chat. And one of the members said, I think I'm going to give up my podcast. Well, of course, knowing me, I was like, well, why? Why would you give up your podcast? I do believe podcasts are a huge marketing tool. But if it's not working for you, they are a lot of work. You have to consistently show up, create content. And I can understand why you might want to give it up. What is creating revenue in your business? How can we grow that? So as she and I started talking on the coffee chat and everyone was listening in, so I wish we had recorded it for everybody, but we didn't. As we sat talking, she said, I've got a $10,000 mastermind. That's where the revenue is. I was like, oh my God, that's awesome. How often do you do the mastermind? She's like, once a year. Well, why? I don't have enough people in the mastermind. I said, oh, is that why you actually originally created your podcast? Because you wanted to feed the mastermind. Of course, her answer was yes. So I said, that's cool. What fed the mastermind? And she's like, well, I held an event a couple of uh, months ago and we had 62 people come to the event. And at the event, I sold spaces into the mastermind. And I was like, that's awesome. That's a great funnel. Let's back the boat up then and figure out how did you get those 62 people into the event? We clearly need to help you do more of that because if you have more people at the events, you can make money at the events, but you could probably sell more masterminds, which is really where your revenue is coming from. Well, guys, when we really dug into it and started, and I had her right there on the computer, pull up some of her stuff, dig into her database. And then I said, come back to me a week from now and let's talk about what you found. So yesterday at that same weekly conversation, the podcast, her that we had, she popped back in and her answer was a little bit surprising to everyone, including myself. Her answer was, I can't give up the podcast. Why? Because when she dug into the reality of the business and not her perception of her marketing tactics, she found out that five of the people in her mastermind came from the conference. And three of those five people had never heard of her before the conference. They found her on her podcast. And because they listened to her podcast, they came to the conference because she showed up in person at the conference like they expected her to because she sounded and acted exactly like she did on her podcast. 
they decided she was the coach for them and joined the mastermind. Now that may not sound like a whole lot, two, three people out of 10 in a mastermind, but when you do the numbers, it was about 20 to 30% of her mastermind money came directly from her podcast. So when she broke that down and compared to Instagram ads or going live on Instagram or anything else that she'd done, she was like, Joanne, my podcast I thought was a flop because it doesn't have a huge audience. It's actually the biggest revenue maker in my business. It funnels into where I need it to funnel into. So now I said, great, then you need to keep doing your podcast. And now let's figure out how you can convert it at even a bigger level. Because she could have done shiny object syndrome. She could have just started throwing ads on Facebook or doing some other form of marketing to fill that mastermind. Instead, she took the time to evaluate her marketing tactics down to the nitty gritty and discovered the thing that she was going to get rid of is the only thing she needed to keep. Okay, the third marketing mistake you could be making, and guys, this one is really a deal killer. Like it, it can actually bankrupt you, is not curating something that your modern client actually wants. I mean, falling into the trap of the marketing techniques of, because we've always done it this way, we should keep doing it. I've seen so many entrepreneurs fall into this little, you know, snag, especially again in the real estate community. I started my business out, I sent out probably 10,000 postcards a month and it generated quite a lot of business for me. Fast forward 22 years, if I still chose to do that today because I've always done it that way, I think actually I would have gone bankrupt as an agent. And I see a lot of other people do that too, because I wouldn't have taken a modern look at my consumer and said, they are not trying to find homes for sale or an agent by a postcard in the mail. They're going to get online. They're going to find you on Instagram. They're going to check out your podcast. They're going to look at you on YouTube. They're going to go figure out who you are as a company or a brand before they ever want to work with you. One of the other Really big examples I can give you of who's fallen into this trap recently is Bed Bath & Beyond. Have you guys noticed that a lot of their stores are shuttering, closing shop? Well, here's what happened behind the scenes. Bed Bath & Beyond is the store that you go to for your kitchen appliances or your bedroom stuff or the vacuum cleaner that you need. I've bought several Roombas there, but you only go when you have a 20% off coupon. Am I right? Somebody give me a snap snap. Yeah, I'm right. You wait until you have those coupons in hand. They come in the mail or you give them your almighty email address so that you can get them in the email. But you're only going to shop Bed Bath & Beyond when you do have that coupon. Bed Bath & Beyond chose to ignore that. They looked at all of their competitors like Target that created its own private brand and Publix has its own brand of food. And they looked around and said, well, if they can do it, so can we. And so they started creating a private label of kitchen mixers or duvet covers. And they started trying to sell that. And they put all of their marketing dollars into their private label. And they put a lot of efforts into their private label. In a time when consumers were ordering more and more stuff online through cheaper options like Amazon. Now, I'm not saying Bed Bath & Beyond should have actually lowered their prices. What I'm saying is, they ignored who their target audience actually was. People didn't go to Bed Bath & Beyond to buy a mixer. They went to buy the KitchenAid mixer. And they went there because they had the 20% off coupon and they could get the KitchenAid mixer, the good stuff. They chose to go to Bed Bath & Beyond over the Walmart and Bed Bath & Beyond chose to ignore that. And as a result, they are having to shut down a lot of their stores right now. The other, and this is a great example. My friend Brittany actually showed this one to me, David's Bridal. I haven't actually thought about David's Bridal in a good 20 years since I got married, but David's Bridal used to actually state in some of their commercial that one of every four brides wore a David's Bridal dress on their wedding day because they really had cornered the market for the bridal dress. Now, again, they chose to ignore the shift in the economy. And they chose to ignore the shift in the consumer. The consumer stopped wanting the $10,000 dress from David's bridal. The consumer began being a lot more conscious over how they were spending their money on their wedding. 
they started wanting the barn weddings, the outdoor weddings, the less frills, more fun weddings. They started to have the bride and groom or partners that wanted that experience that didn't break the bank because they knew that they wanted to start a life together, not in debt over a wedding. And David's bridal ignored the signs. They kept going exactly how they'd always gone. Why? Because quote unquote, they cornered the market. They were the big boys. This would have been a simple fix. They could have easily put a line in their brand of more affordable dresses. They could have easily really toned down the frills, the styles, the everything in order to accommodate both the bride who wanted that type of wedding dress or the bride who wanted simple, plain, and inexpensive. But because they chose not to tailor to the modern day consumer, guess what, guys? They filed bankruptcy. David's bridal won't be around much longer, and it's their own doing because they ignored a simple marketing mistake. They thought they knew their consumer, and they weren't paying attention to who that consumer actually is. Lastly, number four, here's also... I guess they're really all my favorites, but this is a motto I've lived by almost my entire career. If you are a jack of all trades, you are a master of none. Let me break this down for you in the context of marketing mistakes. Your brand needs to define two to three pillars and go all out in them. That's what makes you stand out for the mass market. You don't need to be the person who talks about everything or sells everything. You just need to hone in on those two to three things that really light you up, make you a little bit special and and let that be your content and let that be your message. I'm going to take Natalie Ellis's company, Boss Babe, for example. You've probably heard of Boss Babe. It's amazing. I'm a member of it myself. Boss Babe's brand is for women entrepreneurs, which is really generic. Actually, their website greets you with the phrase, we exist to help ambitious women make more money and build lives they love. So when you look at this and you look at joining their membership, which is the society, you think they're going to talk about everything. When really Boss Babes is pretty clear that they're going to give you a little bit of everything, but they're going to hone in on a few things. One being your finances, because without them, you have no business. And one being your social media. So they have Influencer School, which you can join. That's all about how to create influence to build your business on. They host a lot of workshops on social media. They have webinars, they have paid stuff, and they have free stuff. The pillar of influence and social media is one of the main things they hone in on as a company, although their company encompasses almost everything you need to be a female entrepreneur. But all of the other stuff are little bitty pieces to what they teach, what they showcase, and what they help you learn. The big stuff that they focus on, the stuff they put the masterminds on, the stuff they put the masterclasses on, the stuff you get a million emails about, it is all about social media and influence with some finance and freedom thrown in there because those are the pillars that they concentrate on. Let's also take a look at like Amy Porterfield. She's kind of a baddie in this space. Amy Porterfield is known for her Digital Creators Academy. It is her 10-week online class that you, I think you have modules that you can learn from, and she goes online and talks you through some of them in like a group coaching type situation. It's really for digital creators. It's her thing. Now, if you listen to her podcast, Online Marketing Made Easy, Amy touches on a lot of pieces of being, once again, an entrepreneur. Everything from writing show notes for her podcast to how she creates her team to how she uses companies for payroll. But a lot of what she focuses on, one of her pillars is digital courses. How to create email lists is another big pillar for her. So you'll notice if you listen to Amy that every couple of episodes on her podcast or every couple of webinars that she puts out online or every... You know, every kind of thing that she comes back to in all of her marketing, it's going to have a heavy emphasis on digital courses or email. Those are her two pillars. They make her stand out from the crowd of people that help entrepreneurs. Getting clear on some of the things that you can be mistress of means that you're not the jack of all trades. And that 
is how your marketing helps you stand out and make money. And honey, without the revenue, you're wasting your time. So here's my question to you. What pillars are you doubling down on? Are you tossing spaghetti strands on the wall to see which one sticks and just hoping that someone finds your brand? Are you creating a business that resonates with modern preferences or are you stuck in the same thing that other people did 15 years ago? Are you daring to be different in your brand? Tell me, let's have a conversation. Hop into my Instagram on at it's Joanne Bolt and let me know which one of these you slapped your hand to your face and went, oh no, that's me. And until next Thursday, keep building that business and put a microphone on it.